Okay, welcome everyone again uh, for the third episode of this Blockchain uh, Yale series. I'm Diana. I am an um, alum of the business school uh, from 2017. My initial experience has been with development banking in Washington, D.C., and then got my MBA, and uh, I went into the tech space um, from a lens of compliance in, in the blockchain world. And I'm here. I'm, I'm really happy to be joined by Garrett Kinsman, and uh, he's the co-founder of a company called Noto, and he's going to explain all about it to us. Um, and he's built mesh networks in the past, which are decentralized internet networks, and he's going to talk to us about how these functionalities can be really interesting for COVID contact tracing. So welcome, Garrett. Thank you for having me on. So we're going to start with a video to begin with. So give me a second to share my screen. Be that applause. Um, so, Garrett, could you walk us through technically what's going on in that video? Yo, what's sure. up, guys? Andy here back for oh. days. There we go. The, uh, so, uh, that's kind of just a fun um, description of, uh, of, of how Nodal works. Um, we have uh, basically, we use smartphones as the infrastructure. So, the big problem out there is connecting things to the internet is really hard. So you need a SIM card or a big antenna. Um, and so what we use is the Bluetooth technology that's in all of our smartphones and is really low cost. And we use the smartphones as the infrastructure. So what you saw there was um, Elliot, our blockchain developer, our blockchain architect, uh, running the Nodal Cash app, which is a, an app that we built that enables anybody to basically become a node in the network. So the smartphone, as you move throughout your city or your environment, you're locating and connecting nearby IoT devices. And we use that as a form of a very basic mesh network or as a backhaul to connect things. So first of all, could you define what is a mesh network? So a mesh network is the idea that you can have two devices communicate with each other um, without having to go up to the internet. So it's actually how some of the, the earliest um, kind of networks were developed where you would just connect directly to somebody. Um, it's essentially how we talk to each other, uh, at least when we're not uh, in COVID. When you have a conversation with your friend in person, um, you're talking to each other and then you talk to your friend next to you. Um, that's kind of a mesh network, it's a decentralized communication. Now, when we're all talking onto the phone, um, our voice goes up to a network and then back down, and that's a more centralized type of network. Right. So technically, you have Bluetooth, Bluetooth icons in the video, which are the connected devices. And we know that there's millions and billions and, and potentially up to trillions in the future of connected devices all over the world. And yeah. it's kind of a Pokemon Go concept, right? Where yeah. the person who's walking around just doing his thing in a city is his phone is, is connecting devices is connecting information about devices and uh, there's a peer-to-peer -peer communication like you said and um, there there's a location data gathering which which we're going to get to and and it's the concept that we're going to get to right now first we're going to talk about the general uh, concept and then we're going to drill in, into a more narrow example of how this could be used for COVID I, I should have mentioned that before 
Uh, sure. But it's, it's valuable to send and gain insights for businesses to make decisions, right? And could you explain a little bit more about that? Sure. I mean, again, we have the problem. It's really hard to connect things to the internet. So what we do is we use existing infrastructure, your phones and Bluetooth, which is really cheap um, to gather that type of data. Um, and we believe that, you know, the world is getting more difficult. We have climate change, we have COVID, we have all of these problems. And we believe in a very scientific approach, you know, understanding what's happening first. What's the temperature? What's the pollution like? Um, how are people interacting? And to do and solve these problems, you need data. And so what we've done is made that data in order of magnitude easier to get by leveraging smartphones and using them to communicate with the, the world around us and doing that in mass. So, I mean, we have... Um, right around 5 million smartphones each day that participate in our network. And okay. the types, oh, go ahead. No, yeah, sure. And, and what I was gonna say that the types of data that we're focusing on right now are very simple things like, um, what's the location of a shipping pallet? So we have fruits and vegetables um, being transported all around the United States. And one of our customers puts the small Bluetooth tag on that shipping pallet and it starts to show up on our network. Um, so we use this crowd of smartphones, of, of millions of smartphones to locate and to connect to this very basic asset, which is a, a shipping pallet. Right, but essentially anything could be a connected device, right? And I know you have a sticker, a Bluetooth sticker. So it, technically if I, I, I stick a Bluetooth sticker to my pen, anything can be connected. Yeah. It's okay. Got it. So <laughs> we have the, uh, I have one on my notebook um, I collect all kinds of random stickers. And so this blue sticker here, it's, you know, very thin, um, is actually a Bluetooth tag. So it's, it's made by one of our friends. It has a battery. It has a small, um, arm. Yeah. yeah and there's an eco-friendly component to it, right? It's cheap. It's, it's easy and it doesn't take up a lot of energy and you can basically connect anything. But the point that I'm trying to get to here is that with that very simple device, you can connect anything and you can gather a ton of insights. So that is, is the really interesting part of it, right? The data and the insights that you can get to. And, and like you're saying, it's pretty simple. Location, time, and, and you can do a lot of those things. You can make a lot of business decisions based, based off of that data, especially exactly. when it's real time, right? One, so one good moving example. into what are the nodes and can anyone do this? Can anyone participate in this? Internet of Things devices, they're all nodes. In, in the network, they're the best collectors of information. The smartphone infrastructure behind it um, is, is pretty solid and, and we can rely on it and, and um, basically how to build a network. Sure, um, and apologies for talking over you. I think there's a bit of latency. No, it's fine. We're just um, chatting. Yeah, uh, so the nodes is really interesting. Um, we believe that anybody should be able to build and deploy internet infrastructure. Today, it might be a delay tolerant IOT type network, um, but in the future, it can be 5G. Um, you know, th it's very simple now to deploy wireless infrastructure um, and it's getting even easier. So today we have really two, um, I guess three types of, of um, people or entities that are nodes. The first is anybody. So you can go on the Apple uh, App Store or the, node, or the, um, the Android and download Nodal Cache, which is our app. And in this case, you are um, contributing some of your Bluetooth and um, you're becoming a, a node in the network. And in exchange, you're earning cryptocurrency. So we pay, we've built an economic model and incentive um, for the work that you perform because you're doing something. Um, the second type are app developers. So for the history of the internet as we know it, Google, Facebook, Snapchat, all of these companies make money by advertising. They collect as much data on their users and they use it back to sell you things. Unfortunately, some of this data is also resold and used to sell you things or ideas. Um, and so we believe that there should be another way to monetize the internet as we know it without impacting user privacy. So what we've done is we've built an SDK that can go in apps like games and things like that, that help the app developer make money by earning cryptocurrency um, and also provide the free apps and the great user experience um, so you don't have to sit and watch ads before every video, uh, for example. So okay. 
we have so, anybody can download for you here i'm going to oh. say uh talking about bluetooth most people might think bluetooth is not secure and they may not even understand like bluetooth because we have some people here who are not necessarily engineers and yeah. does it kill battery so bluetooth inherently is not very secure so we've actually had to build um a lot of standards uh, around um, kind of our network to make it secure. Um, so I'm happy to go go into that later. Um, Bluetooth kind of when you're you're pairing. So say if you're connected to my headphones, um, that's very difficult to to hack essentially. Um, but what a lot of Bluetooth devices today do is shout information. So it's a public called an advertising packet, and in this they usually um, give their name. They tell you what the device is, and they can also open up certain attributes. So they can transmit things like the battery level or the temperature or the humidity. Um, and this is really interesting and useful data. And so what we're working on now are ways to further protect the identity of the device, um, to also establish encrypted communications with the device. Uh, the first step of that being a query for a public key. So I asked okay, the we're gonna talk to, we're gonna talk we're gonna get there um, and, exactly yeah and so the battery life impact um, it's almost nothing it's one or two percent per 24 okay. hours this is because your Bluetooth is already on all the time on your phone you have airpods um, and Bluetooth headphones and you connect with your car so modern smartphones and modern operating systems are designed to have Bluetooth running all the time. Um, and so it's they're very simple. Running. It's pretty much integrated into our existing infrastructures, which is pretty yeah. much key to get these innovations and these networks. And we're going to get to the blockchain component of it to, to get all those things up and running, right? So let's talk about the business model behind this, because we're talking about, there's a lot of data. And we're all weary right now about companies making money out of our data. And how can we make a business model where the user themselves or the people themselves own their own data? Yeah. And um, you speak of a new economic model. So the incentives and, and how would the revenue structure work? How, how would that work? Who would be the players and how, how would this be essentially a business? So essentially we have supply and demand. So supply, as we mentioned, is created by anybody, app developers, um, uh, individual users. We had a partnership with HTC um, that was running our, our app as well. Um, and so that's supply. We've been able to create this network. We also have demand. So these are things like um, big industrial customers that want to track shipping pallets. So it's not very exciting, um, but it's, it's a great use case. We also have people like um, uh, people that are helping track stolen cars. So what we've done is put small Bluetooth tags and uh, we can hide them inside vehicles. So if your car gets stolen, eventually it'll show up on our network. And you can put 10 or 20 of these on your car and it, do it doesn't cost very much. Um, and obviously this, this creates privacy concerns. So what we've done is worked very hard to enable essentially key management. So uh, whoever has control over the IoT devices can decrypt the information. And we prefer for that to be the end customer. Um, and in the case of network providers, the end user. So in the case of the Nodal Cash app, you actually have your own public key. This is my public key. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you see it. Um, and this key allows me to um, not only receive Nodal Cash for performing work, but it allows me to sign and encrypt information. And so I can use that key to, to protect my information. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're building the same way for IoT devices to do that as well, so that we can have data be routed through our network, for example, the identity of your car, and it could only be decrypted by the end customer. Right. Um, and this is a very, uh, like the cryptography component, it's very um, what a lot of blockchain infrastructures are built on, right? That everybody yeah. has a public key and a private key, and they're long strings, like what Garrett showed, they're long strings of alphanumeric numbers that can be used to, to certify uh, decisions when, when you make a transaction or when you want something yeah. appended on, onto the blockchain or to add new data, um, you can you use those private and public keys. And, and yeah. it's, uh, there's also a um, security component to it as well because only your 
public key is shown in the network and the private key is yours. And, and that's the component of security. But uh, tying it also to, to the business, right? We have a context where there would be subscribers who would be interested in, in acquiring this data to make decisions in their businesses and they would pay the network, right? And we know that in, in the business world, in the world, there's a lot of consortiums, right? Consortia, mm -hmm. <laughs> where, where a lot of businesses get together to, to make decisions and, and uh, it's valuable for them to have insights on each other. So, so they pay the consortium, right? But in this, in this context, the subscribers would pay the network and the network mm -hmm. would pay the users to provide their data, exactly. right? And then, and then that data would be on the location, on the distance between you and me, and 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 simple things like that. But it would not gather who I am, or or yeah. any personal what, information about what me. What we do right? is is use your your key on your phone to actually encrypt your identity. And so we do this in a way that basically output a random string of numbers, so that only if you have your private key or a really big supercomputer, you can understand what's happening. Um, and so um, we use that to essentially give you control over your data. So if you wanted to, you could query our system and, and get data back, which under GDPR is required. Um, but also so that um, any data we collect, uh, you can't tie back to a user, even if it hits our system. So that's kind of our end goal is to make a system that's very, um, very protective of the user's privacy um, and even things like contact tracing, I mean, we've built it so we don't have a way to know who interacts with who. Mm -hmm. uh, we really focus just on the IoT devices. Um, but we're starting to open up things like, well, maybe if two people playing a video game want to play each other, how can we enable that kind of cool feature in an app, um, right. but while protecting the user's privacy and making right. sure that the game developer can't abuse that power. Um, right. So it's very, very interesting, this shift from kind of centralized privacy where, hey, I'm the big um, top tech company and I care about your privacy versus actually giving users control over their keys. Exactly, exactly. So now talking about contact tracing as an example, could you tell us a little bit about, uh, and we talked before about a Harvard study about contact tracing and, and later about M1, nodal M1. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of studies and, um, and I, I can send you the links. Um, there's a ton of studies that show that contact tracing really is an essential part of fighting uh, a disease. That's why um, so many countries have spent so much time and effort. You look at what Singapore is doing. Uh, Singapore has no cases now. Um, China supposedly is the same way. Um, so you know, wearing a mask is very important. Getting a vaccine is really important, but none of that um, really matters if you have an outbreak that's live and happening and you need to be able to track and understand the spread. So right, what, and also contact tracing, and, and literally today I'm in a WhatsApp group and, and someone texted saying, where can we find a place where we can get tested and not wait for hours and hours for, for a COVID test? And, and the concept that contact tracing would also reduce the need for, for all these tests, which, which are getting very clogged up, and yeah. ultimately reduce um, the like outbreaks, right? that cause lockdown. Yeah, I think the study that I, I saw, and again, don't quote me, but it's, I think it was 10 times. Yeah, it was 10 times. Tests yeah. are required if you have contact tracing deployed effectively. And the big challenge with contact tracing has always been privacy. Um, how do you deploy a system that's, uh, that's private and people are comfortable using? And I'd have to give credit to Singapore. The Singaporean government took the initiative and, and really pioneered um, most of the digital, it's called privacy preserving digital contact tracing technologies, um, which was actually based on a lot of the work that we did previously with an app called FireChat, which was using smartphones and Bluetooth to send messages between each other. Um, so Singapore started to build an app uh, that used Bluetooth to record interactions securely. And then we built upon that, um, launched a solution called the Whisper Tracing Protocol uh, built on top of our technology. And then Apple and Google quickly followed up and released something very similar um, uh, a few weeks after that. So we launched what we believe is the most secure uh, solution that's out there. Um, and uh, we did it using all of our knowledge with our IoT network 
and because we thought we could do something that would help people um, and, um, and maybe help us get businesses back to work as well. Okay, so what is the Noto M1 device? And can you show it? Yeah. Sure, so the M1 is, um, is a hardware-based contact tracing device. Uh, we've been talking to a lot of customers and um, basically the, the app store people, the, 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 the mobile store people, I should say, were making it very difficult to deploy um, contact tracing apps. And a lot of our customers were saying that, well, in my environments, I'm not allowed to have an app. Um, smartphones are dangerous. Uh, we have some people manufacturing fertilizer, other people in, in assembly lines and warehouses. Right, they're so the they essential need... workers, right? Yeah, yeah. These are, this was all essential workers at the time. And they needed a device that was separate from a smartphone, primarily for safety considerations. Um, but secondary, um, it's psychological. So most people in the U.S. don't want to install an app on their phone. Here in California, I'm not even allowed to operate the Apple and Google um, system. If I go into my settings, they, they don't allow me to turn it on, which is crazy. I can't even opt forcefully opt into a system that's designed to help people. Um, and so the companies and enterprises realize that the government's not going to solve the solution here. They need to something else. And so we built the what we believe is the most secure, um, uh, most durable a device, and it's the only one, as far as we know, that's made in the United States. And so it's called the Nodal M1. And it performs everything that a smartphone would do um, with much higher accuracy. So we have about a 14 centimeter distance, and we can keep all of the same cryptography that we have, um, where each device has its own private key and does secure interactions between each other. Um, and then we built a feature where it will upload this data into a secure system. And then the company can can understand um, who might be sick and be able to run queries upon that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like we said before, we've got this outsource, that like crowdsource network of, mm -hmm. of nodes, which are people participating in the system. Uh, how are these nodes incentivized? Like, why would I want to um, use this if I'm an essential worker or like for whatever? And when we'll get to the the use cases or the nodal M1, you're saying. Yeah. So the incentive here is really just to be safe. It's it's one other level. We call it digital PPE. Mm -hmm. uh, so that way, if somebody that you've been near gets sick, and a lot of times what HR will do is they'll say, okay, you know, somebody in the team got sick. Have you been within six feet from them? And a lot of people will just say, honestly, I don't know. Like, it's I don't remember. We've you know I've been working together with them for for weeks. Um, and so something like this, it really takes the guesswork out of, out of a deployment like that. Right. Um, so it's a wearable device. Really, yeah. And what's really important is that it doesn't record location. We're only recording the interactions. Mm -hmm. uh, so so we, it measures we, distance and duration and timestamps. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, so essentially, it measures just what you said. Um, it pushes the data into a database and then makes it queryable by the company so they can type in a, a person that might've been infected. And then we can output a ranking based on um, a lot of different variables. Um, and you can see the interactions or the people that might have been the closest for the longest. Um, and so those are the people that you should test. So it essentially can help a business save a lot of money on test kits because you're only testing the people that you need to test. Um, and um, we can even do things like preemptive uh, understanding of which people in a business are the most at risk because which people have the most interactions. Um, so we can even start fighting the virus before the virus is even deployed. And this is going to be very, very essential um, because quite honestly, we have not even begun to see CRISPR edited um, viruses. It's like some very scary stuff is totally possible. Um, and so companies have to be ready. And we believe that this is this is one of the best tools to do that. Awesome, awesome. So I have two more questions before we get into the examples. And I'm going to tell the audience, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, we've got some questions from the from the questionnaire before people registered. Well, well, before before now when people were registering. But if you think of anything that comes up during the talk, uh, we'll have time for Q and A at the end. Uh, 
but we love hard questions. Mm -hmm. But here, talking about incentivizing people, apart from being safe, there's also a component of of rewards, right, in the network. So, which is which ties so, into the business model, right? Where the companies are going into this consortium, whether whatever we want to call it, the network, and they pay into the network, but how are the, the actual users who are collecting the data in real time on the ground um, rewarded for providing their data? So today, today we've separated the contact tracing part of our network with our core nodal network features. Um, and that's really just to, to be as secure minded as possible because we understand that contact tracing data is really private and we're having a lot of philosophical discussions kind of internally about what's the best way to open up some of these features to app developers or game developers without you know, creating a totally scary uh, uh, environment. Um, for the nodal network side of things, so, so for, for, for the COVID relief, it's really it's to be safe. The incentive is let's get back to work safely with as many tools as possible. Um, you know, we've built what we think of almost like a wonder weapon, we should use it. Um, on the nodal network side of things, the incentive is for regular people, it's money. I mean, you get paid in cryptocurrency to become part of the network. Mm -hmm. So I can show you on Android, it looks very cool. You can see the app moving in real time. And this is all the Bluetooth devices in my house that are just being scanned and being detected. Um, it's even detecting this, um, but thankfully this is encrypted. So. Um, you can't do, I guess, stylometric attacks very easily. So we're going to talk about blockchain. How does blockchain play a part in all of this? Sure. What so, does it support? So I even have a slide on this. Um, <laughs> it's like a Venn diagram and like, why, why blockchain? Um, so the first is security. Blockchain is really good at, at like securing that. things. Yeah. Um, today, Today, the entire internet is secured by roots of trust. So when you log on to Google, um, you're trusting Google, but you're also trusting the people that help organize the internet, ICANN. So you're trusting that they say, um, I should connect to the server, essentially. Um, so there's all, all of these roots of trust. When you um, make a phone call, you're trusting, um, you're essentially trusting the network. Um, you're, you're trusting that your keys that are encrypting your 4G or 5G phone signal are secure. You're then trusting the internet organizations to then route your information to, to uh, Google or whoever you're making the phone call. So there's all these layers of trust. And if one of these is broken, then all of your privacy and all of the digital world that you know of unravels very quickly. Um, and we've seen this in cases where um, governments or rogue entities have stolen uh, certificates and they've used them to attack uh, entities. So why blockchain is because it allows you to change the roots of trust. It allows you to decentralize the roots of trust so that you don't have to trust um, all these different entities. You can just trust the entity you're trying to talk to or trying to connect with. Um, and so that's perhaps the most innovative and, and game changer um, is that you remove uh, so many layers of trust when you're dealing with blockchain. Um, it's also very efficient. So if I want to give you a micropayment of one, um, uh, one, one trillionth or more of, of a dollar, I can do that. Um, and then finally, it's autonomous. You don't need these centralized entities in Switzerland with holding keys in a computer that you hope are safe to keep the whole infrastructure operational. Um, it just works. Um, and if a good chunk of the network goes down, um, usually things will keep running. And so it's, it's a very, it's, it's secure, it's efficient, and it's autonomous. And that's why we, we use but blockchain. There's certificates where, where through the blockchain, we can prove that my phone is a valid node, right? That I'm not a bad person, right? Mm -hmm. And we're gonna get here, how does validation work? 
So, so I'm seeing with the blockchain, there's two things. One is the, the security component where there's validator nodes and there's normal nodes and, and taking a couple of steps back, let's explain basically in, in there's different kinds of blockchains, right? There's public blockchains and there's more private permission blockchains and public blockchains, one example and the most famous example would be the, the Bitcoin blockchain where everything is open to the public, Any, anybody can contribute information to it and there's basically no, no screening, no vetting. If I have um, the right infrastructure, I can add like really bad things and it, it'll be on the blockchain and it'll, it'll be there forever. <laughs> but for business purposes, we want things to be a little bit safer, right? Especially when we're talking about contact tracing and, and making sure that the data we're yeah. relying on is, is reliable to rely on, on it, right? So uh, there's, yeah. there's different infrastructures where you can classify certain nodes are going to be validator nodes. So they're going to have a little bit more authority, right? So, so they're going to check all the incoming nodes, like registrations of, of people coming in and regis registering their phones into the network and basically do a little vetting, right? Um, and say, is this a good node and and we can allow it to be part of the network, right? Or is this valid information and we can allow it to be part of the network, right? So that's the way that we in ensure truth and trust trustworthiness in, in the network. But the other section is also, um, which I wanna ask you about also is um, when people get rewarded. So if I'm walking around Paris with my phone and my phone is collecting all this information from Bluetooth devices all, all over, uh, and in the case of contact tracing, it would be collecting information about the people around me and like how far away I am from them and like for how long I am uh, as like the distance and, and how long I'm, I'm whatever distance away from them. Um, and uh, I could provide that information to the network and I would earn a little bit of nodal cash, right? So mm -hmm. in, in that structure, the blockchain would also record those, those transactions, right? The, the settlement, right? Mm -hmm. So could you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah. And, and I think a good, a good way to think about blockchain is you decentralize trust. You remove that single point of failure. And, and remember, I mean, the root of our whole digital world is, is encryption, this idea of public key cryptography. And remember, it's not fact. Public key cryptography is all theory. Um, there's no proof that says it's impossible to break the code. It's only that it's really hard to do. Um, Isn't that interesting? And the mathematicians would say it's it's impossible. You can't you can't break it. But the historians would say that every code that's ever been made in history, in our hundred years of cryptographic history, has been broken. Um, and so it's it's kind of interesting to look at the different perspectives. Um, and you realize today that that most of our, you know, all of our eggs are essentially in one or two baskets. These major big companies that if something is chain of it's lost, then a lot of things wrong. So blockchain is a great way to, to spread out that attack surface so that instead of something being really hard, it's you know ten times ten to the twenty seventh hard. Um, right. So you can make these, these things much, much better. It's hard enough that we can rely on it, right? We can trust it, yes. trust it at least. Yes. It, we're going to know that if I have COVID and I'm walking around and I walk around and spend like 15 or more minutes next to you, you're in California, so I'd have to go there. Um, it would tell the network, right? And it would tell, like, it would create certain, or, or if we work together, how, how would you take that to a practical context? So the way that we've, we've designed it is that we record these interactions, but all of these interactions actually stay on your phone. So they're not going up to a network. Um, they, they, they stay on your phone. And only if you declare sick do you generate a, a that essentially is, is only uh, lasts for a week. So, and then this kind of week-long key is sent out to everybody. And if it matches, if you see that this key as well on your phone, then you say, oh, maybe, uh, maybe I've come into contact with this person and I should get infected. So that way we can kind of keep all the data on the phone and only send to the cloud what we, we need to, uh, to send. And that way the cloud doesn't have all this data sitting on it. Um, and we, uh, you can even use something like a decentralized 
um, blockchain to hold and route some of this information. Right. Although it's very hard. We actually looked at using a, doing a completely decentralized contact tracing platform um, and the technology isn't quite there yet. Um, kind of using IPFS right. and things think like that. Build over time and scale over time. Um, a couple of other use cases that we talked about were, it's interesting here in New York, I'm based in New York, uh, the New York City Department of Health came up with standards for cleaning public places that are not hospitals. And uh, their uh, cleaning staff has to keep a log of the date, the time, the scope of how much they cleaned. And essentially in order to, to fully meet those standards, uh, where do you see like contact tracing being very, very useful? So, I mean, I think it really, we're seeing cases increase um, faster than ever. And so we need to deploy something. We need to get this into factories and areas where lots of people are working. Um, so, I mean, I see it just another tool. It's going to take us six months to really get the, uh, to get the, the antivirus out to everybody. And on top of that, a lot of people won't, will choose not to take it. Um, so we need other tools and we need them as quickly as possible. So we think right. of what we've built as just another tool in the toolbox. Right, excellent. So now we're gonna go into some questions that we received. And I have a couple of, a series of questions. I'm gonna divide this one into a couple of questions. So the first part would be, absent of an active pandemic, how is your business model impact, impacted? And um, is the marginal crypto payment for becoming a node uh, enough to incentivize people to sustain their participation? Um, so, so our, bus our business model really at its core is providing connectivity. So we had um, several customers that were using our products and, and deploying um, really until COVID hit and then everyone said, you know, well, we have to, we have to focus. Uh, and so that, that hit us pretty hard. And so we said, okay, how can we use everything that we've learned to really help? Um, and so the amount that you can earn on a phone, um, it's I, right now, it's, it's the best. We, well, we haven't listed yet. Um, we wanted to make sure we had a, a, a real business um, and we're getting, we're really getting there now with um, enterprise uh, contact tracing, essentially. So the the incentive we think is probably less than an advertising SDK. Um, but then again, people like Facebook and and Snapchat, I mean, they'll make multiple dollars um, per user per month um, just selling your data, essentially. Um, now we don't capture user data. We we built it in a way that it's almost impossible to tie that back to a specific user. Um, or at least we try very hard to do that. And so we think that, you know, probably less than advertising. In the long term, though, the amount of data that IoT devices around us are using is increasing exponential, exponentially. And it's actually surpassed that of human data, according to McKinsey estimates, this year. So that means that all of these connected things, dishwashers and, and asset tracking devices and vehicles, are moving more data than humans are. And so we believe that it will hit an inflection point where the data around the phone will become much more valuable than the data on the phone. Um, and so we're, we're kind of going after that um, in a way that we can use that to protect the privacy of the user and create new models to, to fund apps. So, so if I'm walking the, around with my phone in my pocket and I walk next to like these washing machines that are collecting all this data and I walk next to, and, and the video shows, I walk next to the, the boat that's collecting all this data and then I keep walking and it's not just things, not, not just people, but, but things that are collecting data, I can send yeah. it to the network and I can get rewarded for that. And at this okay. point, the nodal network has like their, the nodal cash cryptocurrency, right? Is it worth anything right now? And it would have to be worth something, right? For people to yeah. want that because we don't yes. want like the crappy ICO money that like isn't worth anything because. And that's, and that's why we haven't listed is we said, Hey, we're, we don't feel comfortable putting this on an exchange until, you know, we as a company have real revenues and exactly. we're starting to get to that point now um, where we're working with 
you know, we're having discussions with huge, big companies that need this to get their employees back to work. Um, and we're the only one that's built in the US. Um, it has the security requirements. We can connect this to um, secure networks. Um, we're the only one that really has that. So that's been, been pretty interesting. Well, we should do another session where we talk about public and private keys because that's really important for security, but it would require it's very interesting <laughs> explanation. But it, the it, next it, question, which is part of this question, is do you generate any other insights to the participants? Um, no. Well, I, I guess we know if it's moving. So we can know if it's being worn or not. And then um, we have an ambient light sensor inside. So that way, if you're charging it kind of in your house or at home, if it's dark, if you're trying to sleep, we can actually turn off the LED. So um, we don't really want to collect any more information about the, the person wearing it. We've designed it specifically so that we could even load this with an anonymous ID. And the HR team can basically have a, a separate logbook. They could even keep this offline of, of who's wearing which device. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we want it to be as, as secure as we can make this. OK, OK. So the next question um, is going to be, can this be used for ESG, ESG being environmental, social, and governance purposes, basically anything ethical uh, for industrial applications in, in something like detect detection? Um, so for example, a molecule of oil on a tanker, did it come from Venezuela? Mm -hmm. Was any component of a cell phone manufacturer yeah. in North Korea? Yeah. Um, that's a really interesting uh, question. Mm -hmm. One of the problems that we've, we've actually tried to solve is um, people are acquiring data sets. You can buy anything on the internet um, and they're using it for hedge funds. So um, for example, they're interested, say an electric vehicle manufacturer, um, maybe they want to play around with their stock price. So they want to know um, how many cars are manufactured, how many people are working at the site. So they combine all these different statistics and uh, satellite data and, and things like that. And so we wanted to make sure that Bluetooth was not one of those data sets that they could use. Um, so that's one of the main reasons why we actually keep changing the Bluetooth identity of this device. So all we really know is that, oh, this is a nodal device. Um, and uh, this can mix in with all, all the other nodal devices that are there. Um, so we, we try to make it as hard as possible to track these things. Now, all of this data that the world generates, um, it, that's a really interesting question. You know, I had a, 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 a colleague of mine, um, they were playing around with shipping data and basically the manifests of ships as they moved around. And they, they were looking at where did the manifest not match up? And so with that, they were able to calculate what was being smuggled globally. Um, and I think it was, a, it was a hedge fund or something like that. So, um, you know, and I'm, and I'm sure um, different agencies here in the US are, are looking at this stuff to help prevent smuggling and prevent things. Right. But it's really interesting when you have this cloud of data, what types of things can you pull from that data um, that aren't expected? And sometimes an absence of data is more valuable than actual data showing right. up because absence of data can show you something as well. So right, it's very interesting. Um, to... my... Yeah. Oh, no, that, that, I was <laughs> just going to say that it's, it's very interesting. And we, we work very hard. I personally work very hard. One of the main reasons that keeps me motivated is that somebody is going to build a giant, massive Bluetooth network. Um, we have big companies. You all heard of them um, copying what we do, essentially. So we want to make sure that it's as secure as possible, that users have control over their keys, because we're worried if somebody else does this, um, it, it might not end so well, um, because this big cloud of data can, can be used for good, for really, really immense good, um, but it can also be used right. for evil. So we want to make sure that it's, it's used for good. Right. And when you say ESG, it makes me think of, of my international development days um, in development finance organizations in, in Washington, DC. And one thing that was really, really important to measure something, like if you have an oil tanker and you want to make sure that any bit of that oil came from Venezuela, or you have a cell phone and, and you want to make sure that any component of it didn't come from North Korea. That speaks a lot to supply chains, and obviously blockchain is a really good um, 
system to to track where things come from it could yeah. be anything right where things are and where things come from and across the board but it's also really important the way you design your project right if you if you're a business and you you have a project and and you want to like track the supply chain of something it's really important and and these would obviously be incorporated into indicators right uh, what you measure and how you you measure the outcomes later on so so it's really important to to incorporate these insights uh in into the very design of, of the project that you're going to fund or, or the business that you're going to build. So, so having that from the very, very beginning puts you in a good position to uh, do the business and, and implement whatever you're going to implement and build what you're going to build. And later on, you're going to have data to be able to monitor and evaluate over time in the future, right? So it's yeah. being forward looking from the beginning, I would say. So when I, and I call it Kinsman's third law is that the amount of data that can be collected on an individual uh, increases exponentially mm -hmm. over time. And so we want to make sure that that's, you know, used for good. Um, and I'm happy to speak, uh, Manish, uh, with you offline as well on this. Um, I know there's a lot of money going into shipping containers. So basically mm -hmm. cryptographically certifying that a shipping container um, didn't stop in North Korea and is now heading for uh, the port of LA, for example. So um, there's a lot of money and thinking going into that. And, and really the only way you can do it is using blockchain technologies. Um, mm -hmm. Right, to do, to, it, to do it as accurately as, as we know, right? Well, anyway, thank you everyone so much. Uh, unless there's more questions or, or Gary, if you have any further insights, um, it was great to talk to you and thank you for your time. Yeah, I mean, thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for this. Um, I mean, I would just encourage everybody on the, 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 the encryption side, you know, think about where do your roots of trust lie in your everyday world. So when you make a phone call, um, when you use iCloud or Google um, products, um, you know, you have to trust somebody. And if uh, there's new tools and new thinking coming out that, you know, this data should really be yours and you should have control over all this stuff. Um, they're doing a lot of this in Europe. Um, and it's, it's really a big shift in how you think about data and data science. Um, so I encourage you all to think about that um, because it's going to lead to some really interesting technologies in the future. Also, I'm going to say another blockchain question that we received earlier on was uh, what makes blockchain go from having been a really big buzzword earlier on and we don't hear about it so much today. And I would say there's been a lot of hype some of it was largely unfounded uh, and why we don't hear about it so much today. Um, wondering what you have to say as well, Garrett. Um, I mean, I hear about it a lot just because I'm in the bubble, but uh, it's, uh, I, I would say because now the real projects are, are starting to kick up. Um, you know, we're seeing Ethereum launch their second iteration. We're seeing um, Polkadot. So we're actually part of the Polkadot ecosystem um, launch. So you're kind of having this commercialization of the internet moment where you start to get these network effects and these new projects that are actually doing really interesting stuff um, where back in 2017 it was a lot of hype but now it's a lot of really interesting core businesses and it's being applied um, I think it's probably going to be you know several more years until we really see that trillion dollar use case um, but it'll it'll come up I think it's connectivity and, and security um, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm always pleasantly surprised by the, 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 the unicorns that come out of uh, San Francisco and in other tech, tech hubs. So and also the concept of data ownership and data sovereignty across the board, right? Yeah, that's going to be a big trend that you're going to see. Um, and it's really going to be a big fight with the tech companies because that's how the tech companies make all their money. Well, there's um, alternative business models to the advertising base uh, exactly. business model that we know very well. Yeah. Exactly. And so we hope that we can be one of those. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Well, best of luck with all of that. And thank you, everyone. So our next session will be in December, around mid-December. And um, stay, stay connected. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And thank you, uh, Diana. Appreciate it.